Okay, notes to four zeros of polynomial functions. So we're going to start talking about the real zeros, not the imaginaries, but the reals. Remember that a polynomial of degree n can have at most n real zeros. So if you have a polynomial of degree 3, that would have three real zeros. If you had polynomial of degree 4, you could have, it could have at most four real zeros. Because they are real zeros, this means they are either rational or irrational. So the rational zero theorem says this. If you have a polynomial, and here's a really long, scary form of a polynomial, um, just a generic, with degree n being greater than or equal to 1, so a linear, quadratic, cubic, so on and so forth, with integer coefficients and a constant that's not 0, that's what that's saying, then every rational zero of f has the form p over q, where p and q have no common factors other than positive or negative 1. So that just means that it's simplified form. If you remember this from Algebra 2, p was an integer factor of the constant term. And q was an integer factor of the leading coefficient. Okay, so let's put this into practice. In example one, we want to list all possible rational zeros. Now this won't give us irrational. These will just give us rational numbers, a number that can be written as a fraction with an integer over another integer. Once we have that list, we're going to determine which, if any of them, are the zeros. So we start with x cubed plus 2x plus 1. So the p-value that we consider is 1 and factors of 1 are just 1. The q value is the factor, the factors of our leading coefficient, which is also just 1. So this is not too exciting. The p over q ratio that we're going to look at are all combinations of 1 over 1, which is just 1. So what's interesting about this is these are the possible rational zeros, but if you look at this function on a graph, neither one of them is a zero. Um, the graph kind of goes off something like this and does not cross at either 1 or negative 1. I think it crosses somewhere at negative 1 half, but it's going to be an irrational number. So in this case, this list did not give us either possibilities. And then it would have two imaginaries. As we look at g of x, our p-value is a 9. And factors of 9 would be 1, 3, and 9. Our q value is a 1, and factors of 1 would just be 1. So the possible rational zeros, again, is that ratio of p over q. That would be positive and negative, 1 over 1, 3 over 1, and 9 over 1. So we actually have six possibilities. Okay, then um, let's look at example two. List all possible rational zeros of h of x equaling 3x to the third minus 7x squared minus 22x plus 8. Then determine which, if any, are zeros. Now, back up to here, I know that that said the same thing. We're not going to do that just yet. We're going to determine the zeros in this next one. Okay, so we're going to list all possible rational zeros. We need to do that first. 8 is related to the p-value. The factors are 1, 2, 4, and 8. 3 is my related q-value. Factors are 1 and 3. So if I want to list all of my examples or all of my possibilities, I'm going to put 1, 2, 4, and 8 over each q value, 1 and 3. So 1 over 1, 1 over 3. 2 over 1, 2 over 3. 4 over 1, 4 over 3. 8 over 1, and 8 over 3. So if I clean up this list, I don't have any that repeat, um, and I don't really have any that need simplifying other than just writing some of these as just integers, being that they're over 1. So I have 1, 1 third, 
2, 2 thirds, 4, 4 thirds, 8, 8 thirds. So these are my possibilities, and I have 16 of them. So 16 possibilities to choose from. So what we're going to let us let you do now is go to the calculator. Sorry, Hold on one second. Go to the calculator and choose a good possibility or a good zero. So we want to get a zero, one of these from the list. We want to see it crossing through the x-axis and starting there. So as we do look at this, you're going to see that negative 2 is actually a zero of this function. There's an intercept at negative 2. So determining which others are zeros, we're going to use that for synthetic division. So I'm going to use the coefficients of the cubic, 3, negative 7, negative 22, and 8. I know it's a zero, so I'm going to put a zero there as the remainder, and then do my synthetic division. 3, negative 6, negative 13, 26, 4, and negative 8. So this takes me down to a quadratic, but then I also see that it goes through 4. So then I'm going to do this division again. I better get zero because I am stating that that gives me um, a um, factor. So I get 3, 12, negative 1, and negative 4. So I now have 3x minus 1 as my last factor. And if I set that equal to 0, I can see that x is equal to 1 third, which is also one of my values. So I can see that negative 2 and 4 and 1 third were the three rational zeros for this cubic. Okay. Example three, after the first half hour, the number of video games that were sold by a company on their release date can be modeled by this function g of x. g of x is the number of games sold in, oops, hundreds, and x is the number of hours after the release. So how long did it take to sell 400 games? So I'm actually going to let g of x, which is number of games sold in hundreds, be 4, because it already said that it's sold in hundreds. So the 4 would represent 400. OK, so I'm going to set four, 4 equal to 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 2x. And I'm going to solve this cubic. So this is actually going to let me factor by grouping, so it's kind of nice. 0 is equal to 2x cubed plus 4x squared minus 2x minus 4. I'm going to factor out a 2x squared, and I'm left with x plus 2. Minus, I'm going to factor out a 2, and I'm left with another x plus 2. So I get 2x squared minus 2 and x plus 2 equal to 0. So I'm going to come over here and set each of those equal to 0. 2x squared minus 2 equaling 0, and x plus 2 equaling 0. And so again, I'm looking for how long did it take. So I'm going to add 2, 2x squared equals 2, divide by 2, x squared equals 1, and when I take the square root of both, I get x equaling a positive and negative 1, and over here when I subtract 2, I get x equaling a negative 2. So as x equals negative 2, positive 1, and negative 1, the only one that really is going to make sense is 1, because we're looking for a length of time, and it's in hours. So my answer would be that it took one hour to sell 400 games. OK. The next thing we're going to talk about are upper and lower bounds tests. 
So this is where we want to trap all of our zeros, all of our x-intercepts along a certain interval on the x-axis. So it says to let f be a polynomial of degree n being greater than 1, real coefficients, and a positive leading coefficient. If f of x is divided by x minus c using synthetic division, we have a couple of cases right here. This is just like when you're trying to find the vertex on a parabola and your calculator takes you through the steps of trapping it on the left and trapping it on the right. We want to do the same thing, but we want to do it for our polynomials. We want to trap all of the zeros on the left and on the right so that beyond those interval boundaries, we don't have any more x-intercepts. So if c is less than 0 or negative and every number in the last line of the division alternates signs. Then C is a lower bound. So in other words, if my signs go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, so on and so forth, or vice versa, negative, positive, negative, positive. If C is greater than zero or positive, and every number in the last line of the synthetic division is positive, then C is an upper bound. Okay, so let's see what all of that means. Determine an interval in which all real zeros, so all x-intercepts of h of x being this quartic must lie. So we want a lower bound and an upper bound. And I want that interval where I have all of my x-intercepts are zeros. So we're going to explain our reasoning by using these upper and lower bounds tests. So what I'd like you to do is put 2x to the fourth into y1 and then take a look at it. So go ahead and pause the video, put it into y1, and take a look at where it crosses the x-axis. Okay, now that you've looked at it, you should see something like this. If you're looking at your calculator screen, you're going to see it go maybe um, down through here, and then you're going to see it come up again through here. So essentially, I want to pick integers that would be below, maybe here, and above, so that all of the activity is in between. So I'm going to test a lower bound of negative 1 the first integer to the left of that intercept. So negative 1 um, I'm going to use to start my synthetic division and then I'm going to take my coefficients 2, negative 11, 2, negative 44, negative 24. This is not a zero of the function, it's just a lower boundary. So as I do the synthetic division, 2 brings down, um, then negative 2, negative 13, 13, 15, negative 15, negative 59, uh, positive 59, and then this number is going to be positive, and it doesn't really matter what the remainder is. So I have alternating signs, positive, negative, positive, negative. So this proves that negative 1 is a lower bound. So I'm going to put negative 1 on the lower bound. Then I can see it goes through 6, so the next thing I'm going to test is 7 with the same coefficients, 2, negative 11, 2, negative 44, negative 24, and my synthetic division. So for an upper bound, I'm looking for all of the numbers in the last line to be positive. So 2, 14, 3, 21, 22, Oh, 22 and 7. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, wait. How about 23? Oops. Hold on. Um, if I can add right, 23, that gives me 161, plus a negative 44 is 117, times 7 is 819, and then 795. So these are all positive, so 7 is an upper bound because I have positive, oh goodness, sorry, I have a 
positive 2, positive 3, positive 23, positive 117, positive 795. So my interval is from negative 1 to 7. I've proved that all of my zeros are going to be within that po uh, portion of the x-axis. Okay, Descartes' rule of sign. So Descartes' rule of sign is a way for us to just talk about the possible combinations of the types of zeros that a function has. So here again is that ugly polynomial standard. Um, if it's a function with real coefficients, then the number of positive real zeros is equal to the number of variations in sign. So sign changes from term to term is what we're looking for or less than that by some even number. And the number of negative real zeros of f is equal to the number of variations in sign or sign changes of f of negative x. So we're replacing x with a negative x or less than that by some even number. Now even numbers, two, four, six, which means not only are we gonna take the sign changes, we're gonna subtract two from them until we get to zero. And we definitely don't wanna go into the negatives. So let's look at this first example. Describe the possible real zeros, g of x, equaling negative three x plus two x minus x minus one. Well, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that if this is a cubic, I need three solutions, whether they're real and rational, real and irrational, or imaginary, I need three. So if I wanna test for the positive solutions of g of x, the possible positives, I'm gonna look at sign changes. From negative three x to the third to two x squared, I have a sign change. From two x squared to negative x, I have a sign change. But from negative x to negative one, I do not. So I have two possible positive real zeros. Two possible positives. So I'm gonna start this little chart over here. Positive, negative, imaginary, and total. So, I have two possible positives, but it's two or less than that by an even number. So two minus two, I could also have zero positives. So let's look at the negatives. With the negatives, I'm gonna replace x with negative x and then look at my function again for sign changes. So g of negative x. So I'm gonna do this, negative three times a negative x cubed plus two times a negative x squared minus a negative x minus one. So as I simplify this, the first term would become positive three x cubed, then plus two x squared, then plus x and minus one. So really the only sign change we have is right here. So I only have one possible negative real zero. So I'm gonna put a one there under the negative column, but I have to look at all combinations, so I'm gonna put a one by the zero as well. Okay, so if we have three solutions that we have to account for, that means that each row has to have a total of three. So if each row has to have a total of three, two positives plus one negative would leave room for zero imaginaries. Zero positives, one negative would mean we would have two imaginary solutions. So what Descartes' rule of sign shows us is how we have two different possible combinations um, for the types of zeros that we have. Okay, now we're gonna talk about complex zeros, and you rem may remember these as a plus bi, and then the conjugate we're gonna talk about as well, a minus bi. So the bi part is the imaginary part, and the a is the real part and together they make a complex number. So if you remember, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than zero, has at least one zero, real or imaginary, in the complex number system. 
The corollary is what we really focus on. It states that a polynomial function of degree n has exactly n zeros, including any repeated zeros. For example, an x to the third would have three zeros. An x to the fifth would have five zeros, real or imaginary. So then, additionally, the function will have exactly n, sorry, linear factors, which means we can take all factors, even the quadratic, and make them linear. Okay, so let's do a quick review on some multiplying and finding the zeros and generating the polynomial um, based on what we're given. So in Algebra 2, you learned about complex numbers. They're written in the form a plus bi, like we talked about right here. If a polynomial equation has a root a plus bi, and again, b is not negative, then the complex conjugate is a minus bi. That also has to be a root. Conjugates come in pairs, remember. Or I should say complex conjugates, let's be a little more specific, are always in pairs. One's plus and one's minus. Okay, so in example six, they say we want to write a polynomial function, we're going to call it g of x, of least degree, which just means we're not going to add anything additionally that we don't need, with real coefficients in standard form that has negative 2, 4, and 3 minus i as its zeros. So we're going to start g of x and look at some of the first real zeros that it has. Negative 2 is a real zero, and that comes from the factor x plus 2. If 4 is a zero, that comes from x minus 4 being a factor. Then we have 3 minus i as a 0. Well, that's a complex number, and we know that if 3 minus i is a 0, then 3 plus i also has to be a 0. So to state the factors that these come from, we're going to use the same concept. If 3 plus i is a 0, then it came from the factor x minus 3 plus i. And if 3 minus i is a 0, then that comes the, from the factor x minus 3 minus i. So this would generate a polynomial function of actually degree 4. We have four x's being multiplied together. But to put it in standard form, we have to multiply these together. So if we look at the first two and we just FOIL x plus 2 and x minus 4, this is going to give us x squared minus 2x minus 8. Now, if we multiply x minus 3 plus i times x minus 3 minus i, I'm going to show you a couple ways to do this. One way would be to list the trinomial or one of the trinomials along the top of a table and the other one along the side. And then we're going to create, in this case, nine different boxes. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. And what we get inside each box is from multiplying what's above the box and to the left of the box. So if I go across the first row, I have x squared minus 3x plus or just an ix. If I do the second row, I get negative 3x plus 9 minus 3i. And along the third row, negative ix, positive 3i, and negative i squared. So that accounts for all of the terms when we multiply those two trinomials together. So let's look and see what we have. We have some things that cancel. If you notice, there's an ix. If we combine that with a negative ix, those are gone. The negative 3i is going to cancel with the positive 3i. The negative i squared is actually going to become a positive 1. i squared is negative 1, and the opposite of that is 1. So what I have left, I'm going to write over here, is going to be x squared. Negative 3x minus 3x is negative 6x plus 9 plus 1. 
So when I put this together, x squared minus 6x plus 10. So here's my g of x that I'm trying to write in standard form, and I'm getting closer. So there are a couple ways that you can multiply these two trinomials together. You can use this same type of box if you would like, or I'm going to triple distribute. I'm going to take x squared and multiply it to each piece. Then I'm going to do the same with the negative 2x and the same with negative 8. So to, that will give me nine terms. So here we go. x times x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. x squared times negative 6x is negative 6x to the third. x squared times 10 is a positive 10x squared. Then I'm going to move to negative 2x and multiply to each term in the second trinomial. Negative 2x times x squared is negative 2x cubed. Negative 2x times a negative 6x is positive 12x squared. And negative 2x times 10 is negative 20x. And the last, I'm going to take negative 8 times each term in the second trinomial. So I'll have negative 8x squared plus 48x minus 80. So pretty long, but now I'm going to combine my like terms. And I'm not sure what happened here, but I wrote x squared as my very first term. Not correct. That was an x to the fourth. Sorry about that. Okay. So as I combine my like terms, I only have 1x to the fourth. And again, this is g of x. So x to the fourth is taken care of. I have a negative 6x cubed, negative 2x cubed, and that's it. So I have a negative 8x cubed. Then I have 10x squared plus 12x squared minus 8x squared. So 10 plus 12 is 22, minus 8 is 14, so a positive. 14x squared. Then I have a negative 20x plus 48x, which is a positive 28x minus 80. And this gives us our polynomial function of least degree, real coefficients, standard form, and it has zeros of negative 2, 4, and 3 minus i, just like they wanted. Okay, so let's keep working along the same lines and look at example 7. So factoring polynomial functions over the reals. Every polynomial function of degree n being greater than 0 with real coefficients can be written as, now this is new, well, in a way it's new, product of linear factors and irreducible quadratic factors. And this is something that we know. We can maybe break it down only so far to where some factors are linear and some factors are quadratic. So let's take a look. Example 7, k of x equals this quintic, x to the fifth minus 18x to the third plus 30x squared minus 19x plus 30. Okay, so with this one, we could do the possible, um, the rational zero theorem and list our factors of 30 over our factors of 1, the p over q values. Then we could look at Descartes' rule assigned to look at all of our possible combinations. But letter A wants us to write it as a product of linear and irreducible quadratics. So we're actually going to go to the calculator. Mm, sorry about that. Go to the calculator and graph. choose zeros to use in synthetic division. Because that's going to help us to break down this quintic to the fifth degree. Okay, so I would pause this video, I would go to Y1, and I would put this in and take a look at the zeros where it crosses. Okay, so as we look at those, we can see one place where it crosses is a negative 5. So I'm going to take that negative 5 
and write my coefficients. 1, 0, I do not have an x to the fourth term in here, so I need to put a 0 placeholder. Negative 18 for x to the third, 30 for my x squared, negative 19 for x to the first, and 30. So I'm going to draw my line here. I know that this is a factor or a 0, so I'm going to put a 0 at the end. And then I'm going to do my synthetic division. Bring down the 1, negative 5, negative 5, 25, positive 7, negative 35, negative 5, 25, positive 6, and negative 30. So these are now values of an x to the fourth. Okay, now if I look back at my graph, another wise choice might be 3 or 2. So I'm going to go with 2, and I'm going to divide again. And I know that I better get 0, so I'm going to bring down the 1. I have 2, negative 3, negative 6, 1, 2, negative 3, negative 6. And this puts me at an x cubed. So I have factors k of x tells me, oops, so I have factors I know of x plus 5, x minus 2, and if I look again, I see that I have a factor of 3 or a 0 at 3, so I'm going to use 3 with my 1, negative 3, 1, negative 3, and I know that I should get 0. So I bring down the 1, uh, wait, 1, negative 3, okay, 3, 0, 0, 1, 3. And now these are coefficients for my quadratic. So I also have x minus 3, and then the very last factor, if I can scoot it in over here, is x squared plus 1, which comes from those end coefficients. And there is k of x written with linear factors and irreducible quadratic factors. Okay, let's take that and look at letter B. Now they want it as just a product of linear factors only. So the only problem that we have is the quadratic, the x squared plus 1. So I'm going to bring k of x down here, and I'm going to rewrite the x plus 5 is okay, x minus 2 is okay, and x minus 3 is okay. But it's the x squared plus 1 that's the problem. I need that to be linear, or I need to rewrite that with linear coefficients, but it doesn't factor. Well, here's what I can do. I can set it equal to 0 and solve for x, subtract 1, x squared is a negative 1, and when I take the square root of both sides, x is positive and negative i. So if those are two additional zeros, I have two more linear factors. i comes from x minus i, and negative i comes from x minus a negative i, or plus i. So here is k now as a product of just linear co uh, factors. And then the last one wants us to list the zeros. So simply, we're going to go back and look at these factors. And I have zeros of negative 5, positive 2, 3, and positive and negative i. OK. We have one more to look at. Letter or example 8 says to find all the complex zeros of this quartic right here, given that 2 minus 3i is a zero of p. Then write the linear factorization. So all they give us is 2 minus 3i. We only have one zero of something that's supposed to have four of them. Well, I, I gave the example today, um, and I'm, I'm hoping it was effective. Think about this just as a side note, and you don't have to write this down, but suppose I, I told you that I wanted you to factor the number 32, and I told you that I knew 4 and 2 were factors of 32, and I wanted 
other factors of 32. So think about what you would do. To find the other factors, you would take the 4 times 2 and you would get 8. Then you would take that product of the two factors and divide them into 32 and you would get 4. So 4 is another factor. So this 4 along with the 2 and then this 4 are factors, but you could even break that down even further into two twos if you needed to keep going. Okay, so that's the idea behind what we're going to look at here. Let me erase this to give me more room. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Okay, so now all we know is 2 minus 3i is a 0. But with the complex conjugate theorem, I know that 2 plus 3i is also a 0. So if I want to figure out all the linear factors that make up p of x, I have two of them. So I have x minus 2 minus 3i, and I have x minus 2 plus 3i. So when I multiply these together, um, here's another way that you can multiply these. I didn't show this earlier, but feel free to use this if you want. I did show it in class. If you don't want to make the box, you can actually look at these x minus 2s as quote unquote the first term, and you can look at them as conjugates, x minus 2 minus 3i and x minus 2 plus 3i. So if I can look at them as conjugates, I only need to multiply the first and the last. So this would be x minus 2 squared minus 9i squared. So when I FOIL the first piece, I would get x squared minus 4x plus 4. And minus 9i squared, i squared is negative 1. That's going to give me plus 9. So when I multiply the two zeros together that I have, I get x squared minus 4x plus 13. So if I want the other two zeros, I'm going to divide that factor, x squared minus 4x plus 13, into this quartic, x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 20x squared minus 22x minus 13. Okay, so as I start to do my long division, I'm going to have x squared up here. When I multiply around, I get x to the fourth minus 4x cubed plus 13x squared. So I'm subtracting, which is the same as adding the opposite of all of these. x to the fourth cancels. I'm left with negative 2x cubed plus 7x squared, and I'm going to bring down the negative 22x. Then the next thing I need is a negative 2x and I'm going to multiply around, mm, let me choose right. and I get negative 2 times x squared is negative 2x cubed, which I like. Then I get a positive 8x squared, and then a negative 26x. And I am subtracting, which becomes adding the opposite of each term and I get negative, negative x squared plus 4x, and I bring down 13, negative 13. Then I'm going to need a negative 1, and when I multiply this by negative 1, I get negative x squared plus 4x minus 13. And if I subtract those that are identical, they're all gone. So this is the other factor, but it's a quadratic, and I need linear factors. Well, sorry to say that this does not factor. So, unfortunately, what we have to do is to find the two zeros for this quadratic, and we're going to use the quadratic formula. Yes, indeed, we are. So, x equals the opposite of negative 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 2 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 1 all over 2 times 1. So we're going to simplify this. 2 plus or minus the square root of 
8 underneath that radical, all over 2. Now we're going to simplify. 2 plus or minus the square root of 8 is 2 root 2 over 2. So if I do 2 divided by 2, that's 1, plus or minus 2 root 2 over 2 is root 2. So these are the other two zeros. Let's put this all together. Okay, so p of x, all linear factors. We're going to take our complex conjugates, x minus 2 minus 3i, x minus 2 plus 3i, and then the two irrational solutions I found, x minus 1 plus root 2, and x minus 1 minus root 2. And this, my friends, is p of x in with linear factorization. Okay, that takes us up through 2, 4.